All right, just to give you, so hi. Um, I know many of you are copying that down, um, but I also will just give you a few pieces of additional information um, before we get started today. Uh, the, I took a look at the inquisitives that you guys had due on Wednesday and those grades are now in Moodle. Um, the schedule also has another inquisitive due this coming Monday. Um, I, that one's available, but I made it on Wednesday instead, <laughs> just so you had a little more time. Um, it's about T-cell receptor stuff and T-cell development, um, and it is uh, available. Um, I will say that um, the way that they let me choose questions, they let me choose like groups, but they don't let me say go through individual questions and say like, oh, I hate this one or I don't hate this one. And in every group, there were like, eight that I would like and like two that I would not like kind of thing. So I couldn't really avoid the ones I didn't like. So there are some questions that aren't great in that. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, so uh, just so you know, we will be having, on Monday we will have a little bit of a conversation about uh, how next week's lab is gonna work and some details of that. So uh, be ready for that. Um, our schedule for the next couple of weeks will be a little nutty. Um, but it's okay, we can make it work. It's all good. Um, I also, so the key to the exam is on Moodle if you haven't seen it. Also had conversations with two different students um, within the past few days um, who were asking uh, when the videos get uploaded onto YouTube or when they can find out when YouTube videos are uploaded. Um, it's not super regular in terms of when I have time to do the editing and when I have time to devote my computer to uploading. Um, but if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, it just automatically tells you when there's a new one. Um, which I feel super weird, like, I think at some level, I guess at this moment, I'm supposed to be like, hmm, like and subscribe? <laughs> huh? Yeah, exactly. Um, so um, I, I guess that's what I'm supposed to say. I don't know. <laughs> but the moral of the story <laughs> is that if you want, because it is not super regular when I'm going to be um, uploading them, um, that's probably the easiest way to find out immediately when I've uploaded them. Yeah. All right. Anyway, today we're going to talk about T cell development. Um, and I've already told you a couple of things about T cell development last time. First, um, we talked about the fact that T cell development is taking place in the thymus. So we are going to have some stem cell from the bone marrow. Um, it's actually a stem cell that's somewhat similar to the stem cell that went through B cell development, but it will leave the bone marrow and head to the thymus to do the process of T cell development. So really everything we're gonna be talking about uh, is uh, our events happening in the thymus. And I told you about the structure of the thymus um, with these two different areas, the medulla and the cortex. What you can notice even from the cartoon as well as from these two different images is that the cortex is much more densely packed with cells um, while the medulla is less densely packed. Um, you can kind of see through it so it ends up being a, a lighter color here. Um, this includes lots of developing T cells or thymocytes it also includes, a, which are shown in this cartoon in blue, but it also includes a lot of structural cells of the thymus um, that are shown in either orange or yellow or varying shades of orange and yellow um, that make important interactions with those developing T cells. One consequence of this is that if you lose some of those structural cells with which the developing T cells are interacting, 
you are going to get less T cells developing through the thymus. And I gave you this example of thymic involution of what happens to the thymus with age where we lose a lot of those structural cells. Actually, a fair amount of it is either loss of structural cells or invasion of other types of cells as individuals age. So we've got both a young thymus and an old thymus um, here. And as a result, the number of uh, new T cells that are made over time does decrease throughout life. It doesn't go to zero. Um, there's a big misconception out there that it just the thymus just stops working um, at say age at a young age, um, and that is not the case. The thymus is making new T cells throughout life, but it is making fewer of them um, as one ages, and it's really because of that inability of the cells to um, interact with structural cells of the thymus. And the different locations, be they say the cortex or the medulla, um, are going to be important for different types of events in the, um, the development of T cells. Um, so I mentioned here that there's a different density of cells in the cortex and the medulla, that is actually sort of related to some of the events that go on in each of them. So this will all come together. Um, I showed you some information about changes in the thymus over time in uh, humans. One of the ways that we are able to study the thymus in a mouse system is that weirdly enough, there is a spontaneous mutation. So these are just mice somebody found running around the mouse world. This was not like genetic engineering. People found mice that don't have thymuses, that just have a genetic mutation so they don't have a thymus. Because this is kind of a random genetic mutation, this is not a genetic engineering, um, the mutation um, actually is sort of not totally clean in that it impacts other things besides the thymus as well. And so these mice are called nude mice. You can see them here. They don't have hair. That's why they are called nude mice. Um, it turns out that the, the gene that is missing in nude mice is actually a gene that's involved in one particular stage of development. And so they don't make a thymus and they don't make hair, but the two things are kind of completely unrelated. Um, but we can do all sorts of kinds of transplants into nude mice um, to both look at transplant immunology in the absence of T cells. Since there's no thymus, these guys have no T cells. Um, and we can also do things like transplanting thymuses in and do some tricky things to help us study T cell development. So nude mice are a pretty big way that we think about studying uh, T cell development. Um, basically, we can put a thymus transplant into these mice and completely restore um, their immune system. Um, there are also people who don't have thymuses. There is a uh, immunodeficiency disease where there are kids who are born without a thymus. That disease is called de George syndrome. Yes, those kids have hair. Like I said, the hair thing is totally unrelated. I felt so bad the first year I taught all of this, we were, we, we, the students read something and they had to like write about why nude mice were used. And I guess they didn't get the, like, the point of nude mice is they don't have a thymus because they were getting all these transplants and they were trying to write me these beautiful things about how you could see skin transplants look differently on the nude mice. And I'm like, no, like, no, it's just, there's no thymus. It's all, that's all. <laughs> um, so, um, but like I said, there are also people who don't have thymuses, um, which is DeGeorge syndrome. Just like with the nude mouse, um, kids with DeGeorge syndrome um, are actually pretty easily treated um, with a thymus transplant. Um, and so if they are given a thymus, um, then that 
um, fixes their amino deficiency. Um, and one cool thing that we know from DeGeorge patients is that the thymus actually doesn't have to sit on the heart. So when we do a thymus transplant in a kid with DeGeorge, um, they actually usually put it in the thigh because it's easy to get to blood vessels and it's easy to put it there. And so they pop it in the thigh and it works perfectly fine. You do not have to put the thymus in exactly the location of the thymus in the new mouse either. It's all good. Um, and so we will often, either in the case of a nude mouse or in the case of a uh, patient with DeGeorge syndrome, take some kind of thymus and transplant it in to our uh, mouse in order to cure that mouse's immunodeficiency or to cure that DeGeorge patient's immunodeficiency. Previously, we couldn't have T cell development happen once we put in a thymus. Suddenly, yay, we have T cell development. Everything's uh, all set. There are other types of immunodeficiency that exist. Some of them, for example, include um, if the mouse or if the person doesn't have RAG1 or RAG2. And so then you can imagine they also wouldn't have T cells develop because they couldn't do T cell development. They also wouldn't have B cells in that case. In that situation, we will often put in bone marrow stem cells, let those bone marrow stem cells go into the thymus that's already there and develop through that thymus and hooray, we have T cells and the mouse lives happily ever after. In both of these types of experiments, we have made an important observation um, because we have set up either thymus transplantation experiments or bone marrow transplantation experiments in lots of different ways. And when you do all of these different combos and variables, there's one big thing that um, comes out of this. And this is that the T cells that develop in a particular thymus develop, grow up with the MHC restriction of that thymus. So remember, T cells are recognizing peptides along with MHC. T cells know which MHC type is self. The way that T cells learn which type of MHC is self is during T cell development. And specifically, it is because of their interactions with those structural cells in the thymus. So here we've got two different mice that have been irradiated. They've got radiation. That's going to kill all of their immune system. So it's going to kill their developing B cells and their developing T cells and all the bone marrow, you know, developing cells. But it's not going to kill all of the structural cells of the thymus or anywhere else. So it's sort of, you can imagine, I have another figure that we'll see later in the semester where we see a person who got radiation and it shows them as being empty afterwards. They were like shaded in and then they're empty. <laughs> so the idea is that we got, we basically wiped the immune system. But the structural cells of the thymus are still there. We could take bone marrow from a mouse, perhaps an orange mouse that is of the orange genotype and has orange MHC type. And we could take bone marrow and from that orange mouse, and we could put it into a mouse of the yellow genetic background that has been irradiated. So we've gotten rid of all of that mouse's immune system, but the structural part of the thymus is still there. If we did that, that bone marrow, after T cell, t -cell development, would lead to T cells that think that yellow is self. Because in the yellow thymus structure, they were taught yellow is self. You took that same bone marrow and put it into a blue mouse. That same bone marrow would learn that blue was self. B 
because it grew up in a blue thymus and was taught that blue is self. And realized that in both cases, those cells were from the orange mouse. So orange was actually like their actual self either way. So what I want you to realize here is that the interactions of the developing T cells with the structural cells of the thymus, which are not destroyed by radiation, are super important. In fact, in these two previous things, here you can see I had a yellow mouse with a thymus defect, and I put in a green thymus. So what kind, what are these T cells going to think is self? Yeah? Mm -mm. Green. They're always going to think the thymus is self. No matter what, they think whatever they saw in the thymus is self. So if they, they go into a green thymus, even though they were, they're in a yellow mouse, they're going to think green is self because we put in a different kind of thymus. I take a green mouse, I put in yellow bone marrow. What are these cells going to learn as self? Green, because the thymus was green. These are actually parts of the same figure, and they show two different ways you could end up with green cells. <laughs> the idea is, it's whatever the thymus is, is what the T cells learn as self, because that's where T cells are learning about self. Um, and so all of our steps of T cell development are happening in the thymus. They are happening from this lymphoid precursor that could have become a B cell and is instead becoming a T cell. Um, the cell has sort of started to make this decision when we see it first going into the thymus. And we're really kind of starting with the cell around here where it's just deciding to be a T cell. Um, and our T cell development process. We previously talked about B cell development. You can see B cell development. <laughs> that should hopefully look familiar <laughs> written out on the board. I'm going to put one extra thing here that I realized after the fact I wanted to put in. So also I want to remember there's some proliferation And there's some proliferation. So the size of the populations change a little bit. So again, this is our overview of B cell development that we've already seen. If I were to be super zoomed out on T cell development, sadly, this is not exactly the way that immunologists talk about T cell development. But I want you to, but I want to sort of show it to you as a uh, concept to help you think about T cell development. I'm going to turn. I'm going to make some modifications here to show you how T cell development would look. So there's T cell development, at least in broad strokes. <laughs> what you will notice is all that I did was erase every place where it said B cell <laughs> and write a T for T cells. So what I hope you realize is that a lot of this is going to look really familiar and is going to, and we see a lot in common in T cell development and in B cell development. What I've also um, done in this view of thinking about T cell development is I've sort of broken up some of these steps into kind of early and late. And we did talk about the B cells in those early and late stages. Um, but with, when we talk about T cell development, we very frequently will divide up our cells into more than just pro pre immature. We kind of divide them up into a few more groups and it basically ends up looking sort of like this. 
we don't often use the terms sort of pro and pre as often when we think about T cells. More frequently, we talk about T cells as either double negative or double positive cells. This is based on looking at the thymus by flow cytometry. And so the one thing that we will generally do is take the cells, take the thymocytes, take the cells of the thymus and look at them by flow cytometry. Pretty much all of the cells you get in your prep are going to be developing uh, thymocytes. You can gate on them, but just it's pretty much all T cells. Um, and looking at CD8 and CD4. And when you do that, you find four populations of cells. One group of cells are negative for both CD4 and CD8. They're known as the double negatives. One set of cells are positive for both CD4 and CD8. They're known as the double positives. And then you have one set of cells that are CD8 positive, CD4 negative. They're often referred to as the CD8 single positives. And we've got one set that are CD4 positive, CD8 minus. They're often called the CD4 single positives. You can see all four of these populations in a typical thymus here, along with their percentages. The most important thing is that the double negative population is the smallest, and the double positive population is by far the largest. This is a very characteristic plot. Um, my class in graduate school often referred to this as the thymus bird, because um, it kind of looks like a bird. Um, in fact, uh, at one point we had to draw an image to represent some stuff for our class, and we didn't actually, we had been told that our, whatever we drew was going to get rejected, so we didn't want to put a lot of work into it, so we drew the thymus bird, and then it got taken. <laughs> So the thymus bird was like our um, mascot. Um, so I look at this and I, like, if I see this plot, I immediately am like, thymus, I can tell you the, all sorts of details about it, because it, that's a thymus bird. And every immunologist kind of looks at this and knows exactly what it is. Um, these actually represent some of the stages of T cells in development. So the earliest T cells in development are the double negatives. After a cell is a double negative, it becomes a double positive. So you can see this little arrow here. After the T cell becomes a double positive, it either becomes a CD4 single positive or a CD8 single positive. We have also realized that within these populations, there is some heterogeneity. And in particular, the heterogeneity among the double negative cells is very important. So we can further divide up the double negative cells. We could you know, double click in our software on the double negative cells and examine their expression of other markers. And if we did that, we would end up like a, with a plot looking like the one on the right. Yes, they probably used more cells here than here. I couldn't get like totally equal <laughs> plots because everyone gets freaked out. They're like, but there's no cells there and there's lots of them there. Yeah, these aren't actually from the same experiment. Um, and we can divide up the double negatives into four populations as well based on their expression of the protein CD44 and another protein called CD25. Um, CD44, we don't really need to worry about. CD25, you're going to encounter again maybe next week or the week after. Um, but the double negative cells start their lives as being CD44 positive and CD25 negative. They start their life as a double negative one. They then become a double negative two or a DN2 after being a DN1. And when they are a DN2, they are CD44 positive, 
CD25 positive. They then go on to become a DN3, where they are CD25 positive, CD44 negative. And then they go on to become a DN4, where they are CD25 negative, CD44 negative. After they are done being a DN4, they become a double positive. <laughs> so these four steps are just sort of a breakdown of what's going on here. We can use this nomenclature to help us think about the types of, uh, or the events that we see in my little scheme on the board. If you look at the thing that we kind of think of as the pro T cell, there are two different types. There's the earlier one that's making, that's doing D to J, the later one that's doing V to DJ. Those in the T cell world are DN1 and DN2. So DN1s are the cells that are doing D of the heavy chain to J of the heavy chain. Well, DN2s are the ones that are doing V of the heavy chain to DJ. Um, and so you can see um, all of this here. Um, those DN1s are also coming into the thymus and kind of starting this process. So you can see our DN1s and DN2s that are, they have nothing on their surface. <laughs> you can't see anything on their surface. <laughs> Um, and they are doing the steps that we saw before as the pro T cell steps. This, these events are happening um, largely in the cortex of the thymus. Um, so you can see that the cells come in to the thymus, kind of right at the border between the cortex and the medulla. And then they go hang out in the cortex. And right now, we're, they're in the cortex. One thing to remember about the cortex is that the cortex is the part where the cells are super dense. OK, so our. DN2 um, does actually still have the ability to, to become certain other cell types. Um, it's not quite as committed to the T cell lineage. You can imagine that developing T cells are perhaps a little more indecisive than B cells in terms of when they've actually decided. And we also have, still have this problem of alpha beta T cells versus gamma delta T cells. Um, so really, at this point, the T cell is actually trying to rearrange gamma, delta, and beta. Um, so, it's actually, so when I say making heavy chain, it's making both kinds of heavy chain. It's, it's trying out a lot of things. So once that cell has successfully made a heavy chain, what needs to happen? Yep, Demir. Need, we need to test that heavy chain. Did we make an actual protein? Did we make a heavy chain? And so we need to put that heavy chain on the surface of the cell. Now there's something different on the surface of the cell. There's not nothing anymore. There's going to be this heavy chain. Well, we haven't made a light chain yet. So we can't pair the heavy chain with a light chain. So we need a substitute. In the case of B cells, this was the heavy chain plus the substitute was the pre-B cell receptor. And that made a cell, defined a cell as a pre-B cell. In the case of T cells, it's the pre-T cell receptor, which is just the heavy chain with this substitute light chain. Um, and this it makes a cell a pre 
T cell. The pre T cell receptor again contains our heavy chain as well as this substitute light chain known as our surrogate light chain or pre T alpha. I've actually heard it, hear it called sometimes either pre T alpha or PT alpha. I don't know why those are so interchangeable, but here it's PT alpha, other places it's pre T alpha, whatever, it's either of them. But it is our surrogate or substitute light chain. We will at this point also have CD3 on the surface of our developing T cell so that we can get a signal through our um, cell. So a couple of other things to just uh, remind you of. When we thought about B cell development and developing B cells, I told you that those developing B cells were super needy. They, all, they constantly needed a pat on the head to say, good job, you did a good job. And that needed to come through some receptor. At the beginning, they didn't have a B cell receptor. So they relied on cues from cytokines to tell them, good job, please don't die. Good job, please don't die. Do you remember what cytokine the bone marrow made in order to give the cells that cue? Yeah, IL-7. IL For those pro T cells, we don't have a receptor. So T cells, as you will see, are real needy. <laughs> T cells really need a lot. Um, and so they, again, don't have a T cell receptor that they can get a signal through. So they, again, are going to need a pat on the head to say, good job, please don't die. If you had to guess, what cytokine do you think that the structural cells of the thymus make in order to keep those developing T cells alive? Yeah. It's IL-7 again. It's the same one. <laughs> Um, so again, this process looks really, really similar to what you've seen. Once we make our heavy chain and we have a pre-T cell receptor on the surface of the cell, we can now get a signal through that pre-T cell receptor and we don't really need IL-7 as much anymore. Instead, we are trying to get a signal through the pre-T cell receptor. We're not able to bind antigen yet, because we need both a heavy chain and a light chain to bind antigen. We haven't made a light chain yet, but we still have to get a signal somehow. And so the pre-TCR um, is actually able to um, bind to another pre-TCR. So basically, PT alpha can bind to TCR beta and so on. And so if there are two um, pre-TCRs next to each other, they can actually bind together and signal. Um, so um, we can get a signal here even if it's not through antigen. It's just saying, yes, there is a functional protein that will um, be able to signal. With our pre-B cells and our pre-B cell receptor, if you remember, there were a bunch of events that had to happen in the pre-B cell. So we had a whole list of events that happened de dependent on pre-BCR signaling. You might even, I don't know, have had an exam question where you had to list some of them. There are also some events that happen in pre-TCR with signaling from the pre-T cell receptor, pre-TCR signaling. One of those events is survival, just like it was in B cells. Good job, don't die. One of those things is that we turn on proliferation of those cells. Hey cell, you did a good job making a new heavy chain. Let's make more copies of you so that we could pair that good heavy chain with lots of different light chains. Just like we saw 
in the B cells. Um, we also are going to turn off RAG and stop rearranging at TCR beta. So we're going to do some allelic exclusion of TCR beta to stop making more heavy chain. So we only have the one heavy chain being made. We're also going to turn off transcription of our surrogate light chain, free T alpha in this case. Because we don't need it anymore. We just used it. We're good. What I hope you notice is that by and large, these are the same events as the events that happened with the pre um, B cell receptor. Hopefully you also are realizing that part of the way I have the class ordered is if you sort of get some stuff the first time through, it st suddenly starts to happen again and again and again. <laughs> and things get real repetitive after a little while. Um, we will eventually see our light chain locus start to rearrange. The, uh, the big difference with our T cell is that we are going to start making our co-receptors, um, the CD4 and CD8 co-receptors um, here. Both DN3 and DN4 are sort of considered to be the pre-T cell stages. Once we have made those two co-receptors, CD4 and CD8, then we're a double positive. Um, but us so usually we're thinking about this as sort of being our, um, our, double, our DN3 and DN4 stages. Um, so one thing, well, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. I'll say that in a second. So here you can see this table with those different stages. So you can see that um, we have our, a lot of our events of the, that we think of as sort of the pre-T cell events, the sort of selecting um, expression of the pre-TCR and the selection are DN3 events. The cell will then become a DN4. It will proliferate um, and sort of get ready to um, be doing its uh, light chain um, rearrangement. Um, I always learned that light chain rearrangement was almost like happening on the arrow from DN1 to DN, or from, sorry, from DN4 to DP. So on that, like, I, I always learned that that light chain rearrangement happens like here. <laughs> it's a little bit hard to put into table form um, because it's sort of happening right around here. So it's sort of between DN4 and DP um, that we're seeing that part. I seem to be taking my chalk and all accumulating it over there, which is not great because that's not where the chalkboard is. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times the importance of that, of those survival and proliferation signals that are coming from that um, signaling event. You can see the proliferation being really important here. They're calling it sort of something that happens during the double positive stage. Um, and all of these events that we are seeing right now are again really all happening in the cortex, not in the medulla. So what is going to happen physiologically or just what, what's going to happen structurally, space-wisely, physics, physically, if the cell divides a lot? Yeah. It's going to be more crowded, right? The reason why The cortex is the area that's so much more densely populated with cells compared to the medulla 
is because the cortex is this place where all the proliferation steps are happening. And so we get this really full area of the thymus because the cells just keep proliferating and proliferating and proliferating there. I told you before that um, there is this other book about the immune system that calls the thymus murder university. A bunch of cells are going to die. They die in the medulla. That's why there's so few cells there. Um, so the cortex is where the proliferation is happening. It is really where we're getting this um, sort of big density of cells. With B cells, we could sort of move on in a sort of straightforward fashion here. But with T cells, there is a little, there are complications because T cells. And one of those complications has to do with the fact that we have two different kinds of T cell receptors, either the alpha beta T cell receptor or the gamma delta T cell receptor. So we're not just thinking about one heavy chain rearrangement here. We're thinking about two heavy chains potentially rearranging. Um, and in reality, when we are looking at rearrangement of the heavy chain, as I've written here, the cell is actually doing rearrangement of beta, which is a heavy chain, and rearrangement of delta, and rearrangement of gamma, which is actually a light chain. Delta is a heavy chain. So doing all three at the same time. Sometimes that cell is going to get to a functional beta chain first. If it gets to a functional beta chain, it's going to put the beta chain on the surface of the cell, and it's going to stop rearranging gamma and delta. But remember, there's also a decent chance that it could fail. It could you know, get a frame shift or something. If it happens to get both gamma and delta correct first, so again, that's harder because there's two that you got to get correct. If it gets those both correct first, they end up on the surface, and they stop the cell from making further gammas, deltas, or betas. So basically, the cell tries to do beta, gamma, and delta. If it gets a good beta first, then it says, OK, I'm going to be an alpha beta. If it gets a good gamma and delta, then it becomes a gamma delta cell. Um, and all of this is sort of still um, at sort of the same early stage. And so you can see our DN3 cell is also sort of making this choice between being a gamma delta or an alpha beta based on doing rearrangement of alpha, beta, and gamma. If it gets these two right at the same time, we're done. It actually goes like through its own other path that we're not really going to talk about anymore. If it gets beta, then it goes down this path that I'm showing you here to double positives and all of this stuff. Um, so we can see this big difference. One thing that that means is that the cell actually knows when it's getting its signal, when it's getting a good job. You did a good job, live and move forward. When it gets that signal, it actually knows if it's getting a signal, a gamma delta, a signal through a gamma and delta chain or from a beta chain. It can actually tell the difference between those two signals. Um, so that it can go down these two different paths. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, so, so two parts to that. Gamma and delta structurally can only go together, so you couldn't put beta gamma together. So, and you have to have a heavy chain and a light chain. So those are the only combos. And again, we aren't, 
basically we don't we don't allow the chromosome with alpha to do rearrangement yet. It's a chromatin thing. So these are the three that are available at this point in time. And so they start rearranging. The other one is not yet available. So you could make a pair of these two. You can't make the other pair yet on this one. Care me? OK. <laughs> um, and so um, in fact, the kind of exact signal Basically, the strength of the signal and the number of chains. So you can see if you have, are getting a signal that from both a gamma and a delta, that's probably stronger than if you're getting a signal from just a beta, which is a little bit weaker. And so the cell can tell the difference. And if the cell gets a strong signal at this point in its life, it says, aha, I shall grow up to be a gamma delta. And if it gets a kind of weak signal, it will say, aha, I should grow up to be an alpha beta. Um, and so the cell can sort of make these decisions based on um, the specifics. If a cell, this also addresses your, gets into your question a little bit. Um, if once a cell has made a beta chain, it's actually not totally committed yet to being an alpha beta. It could still become a gamma delta. So you can see if that cell makes a beta chain, but before it, but doesn't actually really um, successfully get through the next parts of the process, um, before it gets gamma and delta right, it could still branch off to be a gamma delta cell. The thing that really makes the cell branch here or makes the cell decide is that when we rearrange alpha, when we make alpha, we delete delta. So the delta locus is in between the V alphas and the J alphas. Once the cell actually commits to making alpha, it deletes delta. Um, and so suddenly, this other path of being a gamma delta is no longer a choice. And the cell is committed to the alpha beta lineage. Um, so now our cell is in the cortex and has made a heavy chain and a light chain. Now we've got it's made beta and it's made alpha. As you can see here, and it's now become a double positive. Oops. Just like we saw with B cells, again, we're going to test the light chain. We're going to see, did we make a legit light chain? We're going to have both. Um, CD4 and CD8 on the surface. That's how we got the name double positive. We're going to proliferate. You know, good job, cell. Make more of yourself. We're going to survive. We're going to do all that good stuff, as we did with the immature um, B cell. Um, note that this is still, we're right now in the cortex still. So we're going to be in that area where it's really dense. And oh my gosh, we just proliferated again. So you can see this is why the cortex is so full of cells, because you just keep proliferating there. With our immature B cell, besides testing the light chain and um, to see if we made an actual protein and proliferation, we had one other thing that our developing B cell had to do. So what is the one other thing that our developing B cell had to do? Yeah. So our developing B cell had to also check to see if it was self-reactive. We had to do something about self-reactive 
um, developing B cells. And we refer to those as the central tolerance mechanisms. There are three central tolerance mechanisms in B cells that we saw. And I did also tell you about the sort of trick with B cells or the, the flaw in the B cell plan, which is that B cells only get the opportunity to test against antigens that happen to be in the bone marrow. So if you have an antigen that's only, a protein that's only made in the eye or only made in the brain, B cells actually don't get a chance to test against that. They only test against proteins in the bone marrow. So as you might guess, the next thing that's going to happen to our double positive cell is that we are going to do some testing, um, some central tolerance testing. So we're going to see the same issue of central tolerance testing that we saw with B cells. However, with developing T cells, there are really two kinds of tests that have to happen here. So it's not just about self-reactivity. You can talk about, and some immunologists do talk about, these same two types of tests for B cells. But the two is, it's way more important for T cells to think about the two. <laughs> so our double positive T cell has to check two things. And again, we're all in, we're in alpha betas right now. One thing that our double positive T cell has to check on is does that double positive T cell bind to self? And if so, that's not a good thing. We got to deal with that, right? But there's also another thing that, is, that our double positive T cells have to deal with that our B cells did not have to deal with. Our double positive T cells also have to look to see, do I bind to self MHC? If I don't bind to self MHC, I'm kind of useless. <laughs> the only self MHC that is available to them is the MHC in the thymus. So remember how I told you that all T cells develop as if whatever's in the thymus is self, that's because they're testing at this stage against the cells of the thymus, against the MHC that's in the thymus. So they have to actually look for two kinds of signals. They need to get a signal from self MHC, but they don't want to get a signal from self antigen. This is actually a rather complicated issue because they're trying to think about these two kinds of signals with the same receptor. And that receptor, in either case, binds MHC plus peptide. So you have to figure, the cell has to figure out a bunch of things here. And the way that the cell makes this distinction is based on the strength of the signal it receives. If that cell gets a really high signal, and you could imagine it getting a really high signal in uh, two different ways. If that cell gets a really high signal because it finds something in the uh, thymus that it binds crazy strongly, if it wouldn't, wasn't weird, I would like hug one of you really strongly right now, but that would be weird, so I'm not doing that. So I'm just hugging an imaginary person. Um, so it would, so if it bound one thing really, really, really strongly, it would get a lot of signal, a high signal, right? Alternatively, it could bind really well, or at least sort of well, to everything. So it could bind every little thing a little bit. And if you made a sum of all of that, it'd be a pretty high signal. Both of those 
those things would probably be kind of bad if the cell left thymus and went into the periphery. Either the cell would react with like the whole body or the cell would react with like that one thing when it saw it in the periphery and kill it and give you an autoimmune disease. But we need to make sure that this cell interacts with self MHC. And so the cell needs to be able to get a little bit of a signal while it's in the thymus. If it gets a lot of signal, that probably means it's self-reactive. But if it gets just a little signal, then that is actually an indication that it's binding something that is likely self-MHC. Um, and so we think about two different types of selection help happening to our T cells. And because of those two types of selection, we end up with a couple of different out or some different outcomes. Um, in reality, there are four different outcomes. What you will notice is that I've got some white boxes on one of them, and I'm going to say, there's an outcome here. <laughs> and that outcome will be something we discuss later. <laughs> but we have one situation where the T cell gets a very high signal. You can see that that is a relative minority of the T cells. That means that that T cell is going, would be really dangerous, would be really harmful in the periphery. That cell needs to get killed. And so that cell that has high affinity gets a high signal in the thymus, undergoes apoptosis and undergoes deletion. Um, Oftentimes, we will refer to that outcome as negative selection. We selected that cell to get died, <laughs> to get dead, as Dunaway would say. So if we have a high signal, we are doing negative selection. We are actively killing that cell. And sometimes people will say here that we are going to delete the harmful. There is this sort of high intermediate where stuff happens that I'm not going to tell you about right now. We could also imagine if the cell got sort of a lowish signal, right? Sort of, you can think of this as either low or low intermediate. So the cell gets a little bit of a signal. That means the cell is interacting with self MHC. We'll call it low. We'll call this medium. The cell interacts with, with a sort of lowish signal. That means it's interacting with self MHC. And that means we want to keep it. If it, interac it interacts sort of weakly with stuff in the thymus, that means it's, we hope, going to interact strongly with other things that we see that are pathogens. Because, you know, all biological stuff can't be that different. So this one, we want to keep. We're like, yeah, we like this one. This one, we want to give a pat on the head and say, good job. Please live. We like you. You can see that this, again, happens to about 2 to 5% of all thymocytes. And we refer to these cells as being positively selected. So we are selecting them. We're actively doing something to them. But it is we are telling them to live. We're giving them a little pat on the head. Um, sometimes we refer to this as keeping the useful. But we also have cells that get basically no signal, or almost no signal, very little signal. Their receptor binds nothing in the thymus, including a not binding self-MHC. Those cells make their receptor, and they are asking for signal 
to tell them that they did a good job. They're asking for signal, and they're asking for signal, and they're asking for signal, and they get no signal. Um, these cells um, are referred to as two, in two different ways. One of them is that we say that these cells fail positive selection. So they did not get positive, they did not get the pat on the head to tell them to live. The alternative name for this is death by neglect. So these cells basically die of unrequited love. They get no signal, they get no pat on the head, they don't bond anything. We don't actively kill them, but they sort of wither on the vine because they never got any signal. And you can see that that actually happens to um, the vast majority of T cells that are developing. The vast majority of them will make a T cell receptor that does not bind self and, that, and they will die by neglect. Um, sometimes we refer to this as ignore the useless. I know, it's, it's so nice. <laughs> um, this is officially known as the Goldilocks model of thymic selection. Yes? I did. I said stuff happens, and the stuff will be discussed later. <laughs> Uh, and so again, here you can see um, positive selection, where if we have weak or no binding, the cell gets no signal and it dies. Um, this is death by neglect here. Whereas if it gets a little bit of a signal, it lives. Hooray! But if it gets, and, and this is how this, oops, this is how this cell learns. Oh, this is which MHC I'm supposed to bind to. This is why when you put whatever kind of bone marrow into a mouse, it is taught, yes, recognize yellow MHC. Because yellow MHC is the thing it had a chance to get signaled from. Yellow MHC is what it was positively selected on. So that's why these became yellow, these became blue. Because this was selected, testing itself against yellow, only got a signal if it worked with yellow. This only got a signal if it worked with blue in positive selection. And alternatively, we have negative selection. If we get sort of this middle amount of binding, it's, we get the cell to live. But if that binding is really tight, the cell is going to die. It's going to be actively killed because that is a harmful cell. Yep, Jameer. So Jameer's question is, is this happening in the medulla? <laughs> and in fact, um, these selection steps are really happening in the medulla. Um, in particular, the negative selection part of this. Um, and so we're doing these selection steps um, as part of this Goldilocks model um, in the medulla. When we saw B cell development, I told you that B cells only have the ability to test themselves against cells or against antigens that are in the bone marrow. Um, that actually is a little bit different in thymus, the T cell situation and in the thymus. The thymus has a pretty cool feature. The thymus actually has every protein in the body. Um, so, the, so T cells get to test against every protein in the body while um, B cells do not. The reason for this is because the cells of the medulla are really special in that they make every protein in the entire body. And they also can present on class two to help test T cells. Um, this is actually kind of where we had learned about this um, when I was an undergraduate. Um, we learned some additional really cool details. Um, Actually, it, the, those papers were published my first year of graduate school. And that is where we're going to start on Monday, is a little bit more about negative selection and how this production of all the proteins um, works. Um, remember, you have a inquisitive on Wednesday next week. Um, we'll be doing the rest of T cell development, and then we'll start traffic on Monday. And I hope that you guys have a great weekend. <laughs>